we're learning Jeremiah, so if you, uh, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to keep it open there in chapter 23. We're going to be looking at uh, just the first part of chapter 23, eight verses, and then next week we'll be looking at the rest of that as he talks about lying prophets. But uh, this is about uh, one who will come, the righteous branch, as he focuses on um, the prophesied future for uh, Israel. Uh, someone looked at the book of Jeremiah and they said it's, um, it's like an orchestra, yet when an orchestra doesn't just you know come on stage and then just start playing, everybody has to tune up. And you know, I don't know if you've ever, I, uh, I'm, my culture is not so high that I haven't seen uh, you know, a few orchestras. But you, you hear an orchestra, they have to all tune up and everything, and that's not really music. You know, everybody's note here and all that. Uh, each one's playing their own, <clears throat> their own notes, trying to tune up. It's discord, it's not music. Orchestras don't release like uh, uh, the, uh, the CD or the, the, the uh, recording of their tuning up. And so some looked at Jeremiah and they said, uh, the, the, a lot of this, the, even the first part of Jeremiah is like an orchestra tuning up. There's all kind of discord that's there. There's the discord of sin and judgment because over and over Jeremiah says, because of your sin, because of judgment, but, uh, God's bringing upon you. And we hear many notes, but we don't hear a lot of music. And we're still waiting to hear the, uh, the great note of music, I think, is the promise of the new covenant in Messiah in chapter 30 and, and in the future there. But sometimes before we get there, somebody said, if you listen carefully, you can hear a little bit of music. If you're listening to an orchestra as they're tuning up, you hear a little bit of music because somebody might play just a little bit of a, of a tune of a song. Uh, others may play a scale, and so you hear just a little bit of, of music in the middle of all that discord. And so Jeremiah 23 is a little bit of music in the middle of all that discord that we've been seeing. After 22 chapters <clears throat> of sin and judgment, here are some grace notes. And it's music for the Messiah, or music of the Messiah. And really it's two songs. There's the song of the, sh the Good Shepherd and then the song of the Righteous Branch. And we only hear these tunes for just a moment. And then Jeremiah goes back to the discord of judgment. But then later you come and you hear the full-blown music of the New Covenant in the Messiah. And so the first song is the song of the Good Shepherd. And that's verses 3 and 4 and 7 and 8 in Jeremiah 23. Let's read uh, those verses. Jeremiah 23, verses 3 and 4. Then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. So this is God speaking. I'll gather the remnant of my flock and bring them back to their pasture and they will be fruitful and multiply. I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend them and they will not be afraid any longer nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. And then skip down to verses 7 and 8. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought the sons of Israel up from the land of Egypt, but as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the descendants of the household of Israel back from the north land and from all the countries where I've driven them, then they will live on their own soil. So notice how the chapter begins, verse 1. We didn't read that, but woe. A woe is a bad thing. Woe. Woe to the shepherds who are causing the sheep of my pasture to perish and are scattering them, declares the Lord. That's classic Jeremiah with woe. He begins with this woe. And we've heard this before. Dangerous shepherds have been one of the main themes in the book um, over and over. And by shepherds, he means the, the political leaders, the religious leaders who should have known better. And over and over, he's warned 
that uh, because of their greed, because of their deceitful practices of the priests and the prophets in chapter 6, verse 13, uh, it says in 531, the prophets prophesy lies. And we'll see that next week in the rest of chapter 23. The prophets rule by their own authority. And then you remember last week, we looked at chapters 21 and 22. And in 21 and 22, he denounced the last four kings. And he says, they're just living in luxury. I mean, does it make you a king because you have a cedar house? Because you have all the, in fact, uh, uh, Zedekiah has a cedar house and he says it's almost like you're living in the cedars of Lebanon. Your whole, you walk in, it's like you're in the middle of a forest. You have so much cedar. And he says, you gained all that because you're living in luxury and you're oppressing others. So the shepherds have failed the people. That's what he says. And in 1021, he says the shepherds are senseless. They turn against God's own people in the pasture. They are uh, not taking care of the flock. They're fleecing the flock, as somebody said. Uh, it's hard for sheep to trust a shepherd who you are afraid that the shepherd's going to eat you. And so the, the sheep are not following the shepherds because they're bad shepherds. They're not listening. Now, from one perspective, really the history of, of humans is largely the story of bad shepherding. Bad, bad leaders. Many political leaders have enslaved their own people. And they do that because of luxury, because they want to make a name for themselves. Many religious leaders have ministered to people and it hasn't been good. Minister, I guess we could put in quotation marks. They've been bad shepherds. Uh, even today, the religious leaders, political leaders, no exception. God's sheep are scattered and destroyed. The sheep then scatter. And sometimes even the sheep are destroyed by that scattering. And Jeremiah speaks, uh, look at verse 2. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says concerning the shepherds. Notice he says, concerning the shepherds who are tending my people. You've scattered my flock and driven them away and have not been concerned about them. Behold, I'm going to call you to account for the evil of your deeds, declares the Lord. Now, think about this. He says, to the shepherds who are tending my people. Are they really tending the people? Or if they are tending the people, what, what, are, they, what are they doing uh, to tend... Uh, is the, it's the same root of the Hebrew word for shepherd, to feed. And so are they tending? Are they taking care? To tend something means like you take care of something, but it can have several meanings. And I didn't just come up with this in my head. I read this somewhere, and I thought it was very good. One commentator said, take care or tend can have more than one meaning. <clears throat> it can mean to tend, uh, nourish, as in, and I give the illustration, I'll take care of your cat while you're on vacation. I'll take care of your cat while you're on vacation. Or it can have the idea that's a bad meaning as, let, let me take care of that bowl of ice cream that you have there for you to devour. And so the shepherds who are taking care of the people, they're not really taking care, they're taking care of the people all right, but they're devouring the people because of the way that they're taking care of the people God said judgment is coming upon you and when the sheep are destroyed and scat scattered the shepherds bear some of the blame they don't bear all the blame but they bear some of the blame I mean how many spiritual leaders have compromised teaching and morals and have been captured by greed and have given in to the spirit of, of the present age. How many sheep have been scattered because of bad shepherds? They've been driven away. Sometimes shepherds are more like wolves. And so God says, judgment's coming. Now God loves the sheep of his pasture. And so he keeps an eye on the shepherds. The shepherds are to be held accountable for their shepherding. If they don't take care of God's people, God will take care of them, in a sense. And that's not a good thing. Like verse 2 there, he says, 
Behold, I'm going to call you to account for the evil of your deeds, the way that you have tended the sheep. So spiritual leaders are responsible not only for their own godly, not godliness, their godly lives, but also for the sheep, for the church. And one day God will punish those who are not good shepherds who are not good leaders now whenever god's people are surrounded by bad shepherds they need a good shepherd and they pray for a shepherd who will make them lie down in green pastures who will protect them they cry out for a shepherd who won't destroy them who won't scatter the sheep who won't neglect them who who, who won't lose them now in this prophecy God sounds this musical note just for a moment here. He says, look at verse 3, Then I, myself, will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I've driven them. God says, I'll shepherd my people. I'll bring them back. They'll be fruitful and multiply. And so God promises to shepherd. He wants it done right, and so God says, I'll do it myself because you have bad shepherds. You have bad leaders. Uh, He says, after I drive you into the nations because of your sin, I'll bring you back. I'll, I'll lead you back as the good shepherd. And when he brings them back, did you notice this in, in the reading? Skip down to, uh, verse seven. When they will no longer say as the Lord lives, who brought the sons of Israel up from the land of Egypt, but they'll say, as the Lord lives, who brought them back from the land of the north. So did you know, he says, this will be greater than the Exodus. I brought them out of Egypt, but they'll no longer say that. The second Exodus will be greater than the first because I'm bringing them back out of Babylon. And once they come back, I'll look over, I'll take care of them. I'll look after them. They'll in be fruitful and increase in number. And that reminds us in Genesis when God tells Adam and Eve to be fruitful and fill the earth. And the idea is almost like a return to the Garden of Eden, a return to paradise. They'll be ruled by good shepherds, he says. Look at verse four, we didn't read this. I will also raise up shepherds over them and they will tend them and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will any be missing, says the Lord. God will raise up good shepherds, he says, and they take care of the sheep like uh, like the shepherd should. And all those promises were fulfilled in, in part when God brings them back out of Babylonian captivity. So all this leading up, Nebuchadnezzar is going to march in Jerusalem. He's going to capture the uh, the land is going to carry the, the people or most of the people off into slavery. <clears throat> They'll be there roughly 70 years and then God will bring them back to the land. And that restoration began under King Cyrus in the 6th century. And it continued on and they returned in large numbers like coming back to green pastures. And God gave good shepherds over them like Ezra, and Nehemiah. And then if you look in the books of of Ezra and Nehemiah, you have a long list of names of those who returned. It's a complete list. And that's to show God's promises came true. I'm bringing the people, the sheep, back into good pastures and I'm giving them good shepherds. Now, as we read this, God says, I myself will shepherd the sheep. And as we read that, we can't help but think from reading the New Testament about Christ who is the good shepherd. And that's what he said in John 10 in verse 11, also verse 14. The, sh- the shepherds of, of Christ's day, the religious leaders, weren't taking care of the sheep. Even Christ said they're hirelings. You pay them money, then you, know, you do the job. If a wolf comes, danger comes, They say, I don't get paid enough for this. And then they run. And Christ says, I'm the good shepherd and I lay down my life for the sheep. 
And so what he's saying when he says, I am the good shepherd, he's the shepherd of Psalm 23. He's the shepherd here that is mentioned in this text, that God is the shepherd. He's saying, I'm God, and I'll shepherd the people. In John 10, verses 3 and 4, his sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name. He leads them out. When he's brought them out, he goes ahead of them. And his sheep follow him because they know his voice. They're following the good shepherd. And as the good shepherd, he's placed shepherds over his people, over the flock. He appointed the 12 apostles like Peter. Jesus commanded him and he says, feed my lambs in John 21. And then when Peter was approaching death, Peter says, I'm passing the responsibility of shepherding as God has, has done. And there are shepherds, elders among God's people. And so Peter says, 1 Peter 5 verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock that's under your care, serving as overseers. And so Christ is the good shepherd. <clears throat> he takes care of the sheep. And so here in this text, we hear this, this note, musical note, that in all the discord, it's the musical note of the good shepherd that's, that's coming. Now, when the shepherd or the sheep come into the, the pasture, there is this righteous branch, this righteous ruler who rules over them. And he's the same one as the good shepherd. This is Jeremiah's second melody. Now I know Kent read this, but let's hear this again. Jeremiah 23, verses five and six. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live securely. And this is his name by which he will be called, the, the Lord our righteousness. Notice it's to David. Whenever David is mentioned in scripture, we need to listen because God said that Messiah would come in the line of David. Look back at uh, chapter 22 as he denounces those four kings. And in verse 30, he says about uh, Coniah in verse 28, he says, write this, this man down as childless. <clears throat> no man among his descendants will prosper, sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. Now God had made a promise in 1 Samuel 7, um, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel 7, where David, he says, David wanted to build God a house, and God said, I, I'm going to build you a house. I'll build you a dynasty. And so Messiah will come through the line of David. God promised to have, keep this dynasty. But here he says, it appears he is saying, there's nobody of this man's descendants, who, the line of David, to sit on the throne. Is God going back in his promise? No, what he's saying is, you're not, he's not, you're not going to be involved in this, but somebody else will. But God kept someone in the line of David. And so when Messiah comes, he's, he's an offshoot. He's a branch from David's family. He's a branch off that tree of David. Isaiah made the same promise in Isaiah 9, <clears throat> where he, he calls him wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, and he says this son will be on David's throne and over David's kingdom. Uh, in Isaiah 11, verse 1, a shoot. It's like, the shoot's just like a little, just, you know, a little, you have a stump and this little shoot. A shoot will come up from the stump of, De of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Jesse is David's father. And so in David's line, this little shoot's coming. This, this, this one in the line of David. And that's why the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and point to Christ in the line of David. And that's why two of the Gospels make a, a, have a lot of space given to genealogies in the genealogy of Jesus because it's showing he's in the line of David. If Jesus is the Messiah, then he must be of the house in the line of David. 
in the genealogies, it's not just a list of names. It's showing Jesus is in the line of David. That's what God promised. And so this is the melody, the song of the righteous branch. Now notice what he says here about this branch. He says that he will, in verse 5, reign as uh, reign wisely. He will reign as king and act wisely. He will reign wisely. He'll follow a wise policy. This, this Messiah, this righteous branch, will reign in a wise way. And that's what we find in the teaching of Jesus. He's the wisdom of God. He's the wisest teacher that's ever, ever lived. He says about the righteous branch that he will be a just king. He'll do what's just and right in the land. He'll pull, back, pull down the proud and the arrogant. He'll lift up the poor. He'll stand up for those whose justice has been taken away from them. And that's what we find in Christ. On the day when he comes to judge the earth, he will gather his servants to be with him forever, but he'll turn his back on his enemies and cast them into outer darkness. I mean, in this life, justice is not always served. Sometimes people get away with things and, <clears throat> and can pay off judges or whatever. We, we hope and we pray and we are to do all we can do that justice is always done but it's not always done because we live in a world where sin affects this. Yet, when, when Christ comes again, there's nobody that's going to get away with something that's unjust because he is a just king. He's a just ruler. He will also be a king that will save or rescue. He'll save his people. Look at verse 6. Israel will live securely because Judah will be saved. He will keep them safe. From danger. I mean, you think about after all the horror of an army marching in and taking your land, and, and in Kings it talks about how bad it was. I mean, there were mothers who were eating their sons. All the horror of, of war, and your land's just destroyed, just everything, I mean, burnt down, and you're just trying to, you know, you don't know what each day will bring. But this, this righteous branch, the Messiah, the, will bring peace. The nation will return to peace. And he will not only bring justice, he will be righteous and just. And so, look at verse 6. His name, this is his name. The Lord, our righteousness. That's the name he'll be called. The Lord, our righteousness. Now, Jeremiah several times makes plays on names and on words. Um, a righteous king is what the people needed because they didn't have a righteous king. <clears throat> the last king before they go into slavery was Zedekiah. The, the Hebrew word for righteous or righteousness is Zedek or Zedek. Z you spell it in English, Z-E-D-E-K. Or you can add that T on there, it's Zedek. But that's a part of Zedekiah's name, righteous. Well, he was anything but righteous. They needed a righteous king because Zedekiah was not righteous. 2 Kings 24 verse 19 says, I mean, he reigned for 11 years. <clears throat> you have a king for 11 years. And 2 Kings 9, uh, 24 19, he did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Jeremiah pro prophesied judgment against him. God warned him. In chapter 34, verses 2 and 3, he said, I'm about to hand this city over to the king of, of Babylon. He'll burn it down. You, that's you king, Zedekiah, you will not escape from his grasp, but will surely be captured and handed over to him. And then he says this, you will see the king of Babylon with your own eyes. And that's got to be terrifying. The king of Judah will see the king of Babylon with his own eyes. And he was. He was carried to the, to the headquarters, to the camp. And he saw Nebuchadnezzar. And um, he was brought in bronze shackles. And he saw Nebuchadnezzar. And he saw him, but he didn't see him for long. Because if you, if you remember this, the last thing he saw before his eyes were 
and gouged out was the murder of his sons. So they murdered his sons and then gouged his eyes out and then carried him into slavery. Zedekiah wasn't righteous. And so the people of Jeremiah's day were looking. They needed a righteous king, one who's wise, just. And instead, they have Zedekiah. Jeremiah's prophecy about the Messiah, he says, he'll be, that right, he'll be a righteous king because righteousness is his name. Righteousness in the Lord. This righteous branch would be the king of kings. He'll listen to God's commands. He'll be a righteous king in every respect. So they need a righteous king because their king wasn't righteous. Now there's another reason they needed a righteous king or the righteous branch is because the people were unrighteous. They were unrighteous. They had an unrighteous king and yet they're unrighteous as well. I mean, for 22 chapters here, Jeremiah's just documenting over and over and over the sins of God's people. He talks about shepherds, he talks about the leaders, but he also talks about the people. The, the leaders don't bear all the responsibility. Jeremiah's denouncing the people as well. They're really no more righteous than their kings. Back in chapter 5, God said, I'll forgive the people if Jeremiah can find just one good man. And he went out and he searched and he went down the street, this street, and he went down another street and he searched. And you can picture it in your mind, you know, he's run up to somebody and they said, what are you doing? And he said, God said, I'm looking if I can find a righteous man and you're not the righteous man. And he goes all over. He walked the streets, but he could not find even one person to be righteous for the people. Now in chapter 23, Jeremiah finds the righteous man. And that righteous man is this branch. He is the Messiah. He's the good shepherd. He's God's son. And beyond Jeremiah's comprehension, this righteousness of this person could belong to the people. Now, all these prophecies, the good shepherd and the righteous branch, are fulfilled in Christ as the Messiah. The righteous branch is even the answer to Paul's problem in Romans chapter 3. Paul says in 3.10, there is no one righteous, not even one. And I think he adds that too because we're pretty quick to think we're the exception to everything. I mean, your driver's license expires and you've got to go down to the courthouse and you go down there and there's a line that runs all around the whole courthouse and you want to run up there and tell the person and say, um, yeah, I'm just here to get my license renewed and they say well so is everybody else go get it at the back of the line we're not the exception and Paul says there's no one righteous no not one you think you're the exception you're not the exception there is no one who understands no one who seeks God all have turned away they've together become worthless Paul says there is no one who does good not even one and that that doesn't mean occasionally doing a good deed. Sometimes we do. But who is the one who constantly does good and never evil or bad? Paul reached the same conclusion Jeremiah reached. There's not even one righteous person. And so that's a problem. What's, what's the answer? What's, what's the hope? I mean, if you're not righteous, I'm not righteous. No one. In Jeremiah three or in uh, Romans three and verse twenty one, but now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known, to which the law and the prophets, prophets like Jeremiah, testify, and that's Christ. He is that righteous one. He's the good shepherd. He is the righteous branch in the line of David. And the good news is, he did this. He died for us. So we can have that right standing with God. Paul argues in Romans, it's not by how good you can do because you can't do enough good. It's by putting your trust in what he did. That's how you can be in a right standing with God. So we're going to sing the invitation songs 380, Just As I Am. If you're not a child of God, you're not righteous enough to save yourself. And you're lost. You're apart from God. 
But the good news is, the righteous one, the branch, the good shepherd, lay down his life so that we can be right with God. And he calls us to turn away from sin and to turn to him in living faith, confessing his name, being baptized, being immersed. We die to sin, that we're buried, we're raised up a new person to follow the branch, to follow the good shepherd. And so if you haven't done that, we're, we're praying this morning that you'll see uh, the tremendous importance of that and you'll do that today. We're here to help you in any way that we can. If you've wandered away and you're living in sin, we call you back. Put your trust once again in the good shepherd. Put your trust once again in the righteous branch, in the Messiah, in Christ, the Son of God. And so we're here to help you in any way while we stand, while we sing.